straight to teach the greatest teaching in the world. It is great to teach out of the greatest book in the world, the Bible. And one of the greatest men that has lived in the last 2,000 years, his influence is monumental at this very hour. What makes a person great? Very simply, the decisions he makes or she makes. To understand the life and times of the Apostle Paul, we must understand the tremendous decisions that he made. One of them is in Romans chapter 1 and verse 14. It says, I am a debtor. That was the decision he made. I am a debtor to the Greeks, who are the intellectuals. And I am a debtor to the barbarians, the non-intellectuals. I am a debtor to the poor. And I'm a debtor to the, I'm, excuse me, I'm a debtor to the wise. And I'm a debtor to the unwise. Those that are trained and those who are not trained. This great man had a lot of things that he could boast of as part of his greatness. He was born, the Word of God instructs us and tells us that he was born of very religious parents. This is an asset. Any person born of religious parents have an advantage in life that others do not have. In Philippians 3 and 4, it says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath thereof, uh, he might trust in the flesh. I even more than that, because I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am of the stock of Israel. I am of the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And as touching the law, I am a Pharisee. Now, 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 that was quite a lineup of re religiosity, you see of who he was religiously. He was a, a Baptist of the Baptist. You better believe it. In verse 6 he says, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, and touching the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. He was only showing you that he was born with religious blood. And it is an advantage to be born in a religious way. He was also born in the city of Tarshish. And that was a great city that we'll be speaking a little more about. And he was born a free Roman citizen, which would be like, you know, 75 years ago, being born an American citizen, that the envy of the world was to be an American citizen. And, and uh, he was born. He didn't have to pay for it. He didn't buy his citizenship. But he was born. And there's two ways that could have happened. One, that his father did something very remarkable for the empire, and the other, that his city did something remarkable for the empire. One or the other caused him to be a free-born Roman, though he lived hundreds of miles away uh, from Rome. Uh, in Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 37, it says, But Paul said unto them, uh, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans. He brought into play his Roman power, his Roman citizenship, to show that he had something. You could beat a non-Roman without condemning him, but you couldn't touch a Roman. That was a law, that a Roman citizen could not be uh, thrust into prison, or could he be beaten unless he was proven to be, uh, you know, a, that, against the accusations that were, that were against him. In Acts 21 and verse 37, Paul said, I am a man, which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. Now, he didn't come from the boondocks, you see. He came from a, a, a city of riches, from a city of education, from a city of commerce. He came from what we would call today a world city. And so he understood the operations of a world culture and world commerce because he was reared in the midst of such a thing. So he, he was l just letting them know who he was. Then in Acts chapter 22, verse 25, and as they 
as they bound him with, throng, with, with thongs, Paul said unto the a centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman, and that he is uncondemned? And the man quickly said, I didn't know that you were a Roman. And he said in verse 28, I paid a great price for this recognition of being a Roman. Paul responded, I am freeborn. I didn't buy my citizenship. I am freeborn. Then straightway they departed and, 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 and let him go. And your point number C, Paul was born in this cultural center, one of the cultural centers of that world. Uh, he, he, he was a person who spoke Greek because that was the school language of that day. And he uh, absorbed so much of their wisdom uh, that even a governor stood up once and said, your learning hath made you mad. He'd gone too far in, into philosophy. And he says, oh, no, no, that is not true. This is a revelation from God that I'm giving to you and has nothing to do with my Greek background of education. So he could have been very proud of his education. And then in his great city of Tarsus, in which, which he had lived, he had learned to appreciate people from Africa that came with their products, people from India, so they had the black people, the red people, that, that came to do business there. He had come to understand that other people were nice. He had a world mind on the inside of him. Peter had a prejudiced mind, uh, as you read his whole story. Uh, he was a Jew of the Jews. Paul was a man of the world, uh, of the whole world. And a lot of it had to do with where he came from and, 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 uh, and the kind of people that he was around. One of the greatest things about Paul, I, I, I would think, is at your point number three here, that says Paul was born in the seat of the strength of the Roman Empire where he received that crusading spirit that dominated him. You don't recognize it living here, but if you went overseas, within 24 hours, you would recognize that you were an American. And by the time you looked at a few thousand people, you say, and I know what makes me move and what makes me go. You, you, you learn the thrust of what being an American makes a person to be in regular circumstances. And so, he had the, the power of Rome in his bloodstream. He saw those marching soldiers and he said, hey, I'm going to march. I'm going to march. I'm going to lead. He had what we'd call today the spirit of Rome in him, which was conquering. It conquered the whole world. It ruled the whole world. And he had that spirit of saying, I'm going to conquer. I'm going to rule the world. He had that thing inside of him. And he picked it up free of charge from his environment that he was reared in. That, that man that made such a tremendous decision said in Romans 1 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel for, uh, 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 of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Here was a man that though he had these natural elements that most of us would be very proud of and we'd be wearing them around on our shoulders and on our chest like, like, like beautiful signs telling people how great we are. He said that whole thing, as far as I'm concerned, is just done. It says all the advantages, all the advantages that have come to me in that way, uh, I count them as nothing. And then he said, I am not ashamed of that gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. And so Paul made mighty decisions Three decisions that we read of in, in the verses right here. He said, first, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. I'd like to tell you that if we were not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus, we would have already evangelized the world. Well, I can prove it. How many have won one soul this week to Jesus? You see, in, the, in this class. How many Christians in this country won one soul to Jesus in the last year? You say, well, I hadn't thought about it. No, you're ashamed of it. You don't give your witness, you don't give your testimony, and you don't move in to say, I've got eternal life, and you have eternal death dwelling within you, and I'm going to save you from hell right now. I want you to be saved. You see? 
Uh, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God. The gospel is the power of God. Now, he made that decision. He said, that's me. That's what I stand for. Not that he had such beautiful religious parents. Not that he had great teachers like Gamaliel uh, to teach him. Not that he had a clever mind in the Greek schools of where he was reared as a boy. Not that he had a, a world view of things living in a great port city uh, where commerce came and went and the peoples of the world did business. No, that, that was not the big thing. That was not the big thing. The big thing is, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. Now, if, if the church in our country could get a hold of that, you can be ashamed of your denominations. You can be ashamed of some preachers and a lot of laymen. You can be ashamed. But when it comes to the pure, undefiled gospel of Jesus Christ, you cannot be ashamed. It, it, it takes the worst of people and makes them the best. It takes people that are down and out and puts them right up the ladder until they become beautiful citizens of a land. It does wonderful things in the spirit world and the physical person of you and, and the intellectual parts of you. The, the, the gospel of Christ is an innovator. It comes inside and brings that which was dead and that which ceased uh, even to be and brought and made it life. And that's what God wants you to know. That's what Paul wants to tell you. If, if after 2,000 years you name your sons after him and name them Paul, it's for the simple reason that here's a man that had some ideas. And here's a man that had made some decisions. And the biggest decision he had to make was, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. He was ashamed of other religions. He was ashamed of the old religion that he had had. But he was not ashamed of the good news that if you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. He wasn't ashamed of that. And I'm not ashamed of it either. The greatest news the world has ever had is that Jesus saves, Jesus saves. <laughs> and how glad we are that we can tell the world, Jesus saves. And if we could get all those who claim to be Christians to become crusaders, we'd save this world. And we'd do it in a hurry. Can you say amen? And then the second decision uh, that, that he made was, he says, I am ready. That's in Romans 1, 15, the top of page 15. It says, so as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome. And then in the next uh, verses there, he shows you how, how he is ready. God speaks to thousands of people. He says, would you go to Bible school? Oh, I'm not ready. I have to work another year. Uh, would you go to the mission field? Oh, I'm not ready. I'm not trained yet. Uh, would you teach a Sunday school class? Oh, I'm not ready to teach a Sunday school class. Would you witness for me? Oh, I'm not ready to witness for you. There's never been a denomination in history that was ever ready to do anything. All they can do is have a conference about it, write a voluminous notes that nobody's ever going to read, and, and, and that's all they can do about it. So if God is going to have action, he has to get action from a person, a man or a woman. Paul says, I am ready. <laughs> he didn't say, I'm going to get ready. He didn't say, I had a little final business to take care of. He didn't say, that well, I've got to go over here and do something that I want to do before I can do what God wants me to do. Are you here? You've got to find some reason why a man is great. You don't get great by accident. And he called all those former blessings that, that were his naturally, he called them dumb. He wasn't using those for assets. He wasn't using those to climb a ladder of success. He was not a success because he was a Pharisee. He was success because he believed the gospel of Jesus Christ could save the world. And, and that was his success. Then he said in the second thing, whatever I am, I am because I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to do it. It, it hurts me so deep inside. When I think of the millions of people that God said do something, it never got done. They weren't ready to do it. By the time you got ready, it was already gone anyway. If you don't do things when God tells you to do them, that means you're put out of step with whatever God wants you to do. And very likely, you'll never be able to do it anyway now. You either do it or you don't do it. My own sister that was the, the oldest sister 
God called her to, to be a missionary to China. And, and uh, she, was, she, she, she knew it, and the whole church knew it. And, and to evade that, to get away from that, she married a man. And he was an ungodly man, and let her go to church once in a while, but that was about all. And, and she died prematurely, and on her deathbed was wishing she had gone to China. You see, when God wants us to do something, he means us to do it. He means us to do it. How many have ever heard from God telling you to do something? Let's see your hand. Okay. Well, that's what it means. Sometimes it's to trade churches. Sometimes it's to straighten up your dirty life. Whatever God says to do, he wants immediate action. Paul says, I am a ready man. I am ready. And then these other scriptures show you, prove to you how ready a person he was. Whenever God said do something, when, when, when the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, come over in Macedonia and help us, that might have been around midnight. By six o'clock in the morning, there was a man leaving town with a pack on his back. His name was Paul. They said, where are you going? He said, well, I saw a vision last night. And I am performing that vision today. I am going where I was told to go. He was a ready, ready, ready person. You've heard me tell you, and others have told you also, MacArthur, General MacArthur, made such an imprint on Japan after he conquered it, he didn't put them under bondage. He, he didn't put his heel on top of them. And, and they so appreciated it, till they, and they, their own religion was shattered. They were depending on their religion to win that war. And, and so their religion was shattered. And, and millions of people in Japan wanted to be Christians. And MacArthur made a small little announcement. He says, could we have 10,000 missionaries? He says, here's the people that are ready for them. And now, I don't know how many he got. I can't tell you how many he got. But he might have gotten, you know, uh, maybe two or 300. I don't know. But I'd like to tell you today that Japan is more pagan today than it was before the last war. Paganism has risen back up. Antagonistic feelings toward Christianity are so strong until you can hardly find them stronger in any other parts of the world. We lost a nation. Why? We were not ready. We were not ready. A nation that was not ready. Denominations that were not ready. All they had was alibis. They were not ready. When, when there's a need, you've got to be ready to meet that need. You don't play with it. You've got to be ready for it. And, and, and you don't start cooking up reasons of why you can't do it. You'll just plunge into it, you see. And if you do, God will meet you there. Can you say amen? Now, re regarding missionary work, you've you got to understand that. Well, we, we arrived in South Africa, or a month before we went, we tried to get into Mozambique, a country that's been eight years in war, has a Marxist government, and, and uh, you know, not quite sure of foreigners like myself. And they, we tried for a whole month to get in there. And, and when we got to South Africa, they said, you can't get into Mozambique and so forth. And I, I said, well, I have a policy. And, and I'd like you to listen to it. It's this. Don't ever stop going till you hit something that stops you. Are you here? Well, all of you stop before you get there. You just think it won't work, and so you don't go, you see. And, and so we, we said, yeah, we, we can. We, we'll always move until something Hard hits us in the nose. Well, when you get your nose hit, you're hit, you know. We, we went on into Zimbabwe, which is a form of Rhodesia, a magnificent city and country. We got our permission to go into Mozambique in less than an hour, you see. Yeah, went into two cities and preached over there in, 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 in Mozambique with no, no problem, no problem whatsoever, either going in or, or coming out. Now, now, you've got to learn in life that it's your business to go every inch you can, and it's God's business to open up the rest of it. But if you're going to be a quitter, if I had been a quitter, we'd have never done anything we've ever done in this place. We would have never done anything we've ever done if I had been a quitter, because there were obstacles there, but there was a few inches to go yet. And those last few inches determine what you got inside of you. 
guts of baloney. Paul says, I am a ready man, ready to invade, ready to fight, ready to go. I'm a ready man. Then the last tremendous thing that he said was, and we read it to you in the beginning, he says, I'm a debtor. Now, now he hadn't borrowed any money. He says, I am a debtor. And, and listen, listen who he said he was a debtor to. You can either turn back a little or you can open to Romans 1, 14. He said, I am a debtor. Who was a debtor to? He said, I am a debtor to the Greeks. They were the great schoolmasters. They were the great people of, of dialogue and philosophers, wise men, the Greeks. Their wisdom hasn't been surpassed even until this day, you know. He said, I'm a debtor to those people. Some people don't feel like they're a debtor to great people. And great people can be as sad as non-great people. They're just humans. They're just humans. Achievers can have sadness just like non-achievers. And they need Jesus just like anybody else. He says, I am a debtor to the Greeks. And I'm a debtor also to the barbarians. So often we're caused... We're called to those people, that, you know, possibly animists and worship spirits and worship devils and so forth. But if God's called you there, you ought to go there. And, and he says, I am also a debtor to the wise, clever people, and to the unwise, whoever they are. He says, I am a debtor. Let's be very honest at this moment, please. The reason we have not saved the world is that we don't feel that we're in debt to anybody. How could I get an audience like this to feel that you're a debtor to the people in Malawi where we have 45 tons of food ready at this moment to feed them with through our pastors there? How, how could I get you to feel indebted to it? How could I get you to feel indebted to the long lines of people that we saw receiving their food, about 50 pounds for each person like that, how could we get you to feel indebted to those people? Malawi, they're all refugees, all of them. We have also given them 1,200 blankets because some didn't have any clothing. And a, they can use a blanket like a dress or they can use it like a coat. They can use it and then they can sleep on it at night. And we saw hundreds of people and looked into their little tents that had been provided by America. There was not one single thing inside. Their whole that they owned in the world was on their little bodies. That's, that was a total amount of what they owned was in their little. How could I get you to feel indebted to people of that, uh, like that, you see? Paul says, I am a debtor. Then there's some people that said, why? why would you go here and why would you go there? I'm paying the debt. You say, what kind of a debt? I'm so glad to be saved till I want others to be saved. Are you here? <laughs> Are you so glad you're saved you want anybody else to be saved? Or you don't care whether they go to hell or not? I am so glad to be healed. I want to talk about healing. I am so glad to be blessed till I want to talk about blessing. God has been good for over 50 years. And I want to talk about the goodness of God and prefer talking about it to people that haven't heard about it already. When you've heard it 99 times and hadn't taken yet, one wonders if it'll ever take. Ask God that you will have within you the three great principles of truth that were in this man. He said staunchly, I am not ashamed. He said, Vigorously, I am ready. He said with great tenderness, I am a debtor. Now, if you, if you are a debtor, if you don't pay a little bit on it, you're dishonest. If you hide from the one you owe something to, you're dishonest. You can always pay a little on it to let the people that you're indebted to know that you do care. And that's the way we have to do to the world that we live in today. We're going to study the whole 
book of Romans. But it, it's, it, it's interesting for you to understand this man that said these things before we go into all the particular things that he said, because he says some dynamic things. You and I will never forget them as we go through, as we go through uh, these writings of the book of Romans.